welcome to another Scots We Hate podcast and today I'm joined by writer and journalist Peter Ross to talk about his new book Steeplechasing Around Britain by Church. Hello Peter. Hello. Good to see you. And you. Thanks very much for having me. It feels like a, a lovely tradition to come here and <laughs> talk about a book every few years once I have one out. Yeah, absolutely. That's the way I look upon it, definitely. Um, before we talk about the book, can you give us a brief reading from it? Yes, I'll read you right from the very start of the book. So this is the beginning of the book and the beginning of a chapter called Darkness. It was the hour of the owl, the hour of the men who wear the cowl, and the church was in deep winter dark. A monk ghosted in, a white shape in the blackness, a shape that took on greater definition as he lit the tall candles on the altar. His hood was up, his face shadowed, but his quick, precise movement suggested that this was the young novice, Brother Edmund. Bells rang out with an urgent clang, which meant that two other monks, out of sight in the north transept, were pulling long ropes that disappeared up into the tower, calling their brethren to praise. It was six in the morning on the 8th of December 2020, the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, the day of the first COVID vaccination, a moment, it seemed, of answered prayers. Huskerdon Abbey, in the northeast of Scotland, is a rare survivor, one of very few medieval monasteries in Britain still used for their original purpose. It is home to 18 monks. The youngest are in their early 20s, but most are a good bit older, the eldest being in his 80s. They are Benedictines. They wear white robes. They are obedient, chaste, and poor. It is likely that most will see out their lives here and be buried in the Abbey Cemetery. The grave markers, simple wooden crosses, wear so thick a pelt of lichen that the intrigued visitor must trace with a finger the furred letters in order to make out this carved epitaph. After life's fit fever, he slept well. If life is a fever, Huskerdon is immune its natural resistance built up over centuries of isolation. There is a rare stillness here, a sense of physical separation and temporal slippage. The nearest town, Elgin, is six miles and several centuries away. The abbey is at the foot of steep fields, with a palisade of firs at the top. Hill and woods are a looming wall, keeping the monks in, the world out. Lockdown has long been a way of life here. I had arrived the day before, driving for four hours from my home in Glasgow. Freezing fog, ice on the moors, snow on the peaks, a last bend in the road, and there, suddenly, was the great ancient building. Welcome, Father Giles had said on answering the door, to this distant and uncivilised place. <laughs> Thanks very much for Thank that. You. Before we get into more talking about the book, why did you decide that that was the place you wanted to start the book? Well, initially, actually, it wasn't. Mm. Um, one of the features of working on this book is that um, I wrote it during um, the COVID pandemic. Really, mm. I started writing the book in something like May 2020. Um, so all of the kind of planning and logistics um, happened at a time when we couldn't really um, you know, travel around or, or meet people um, very easily, if at all. So my initial ideas to of where to begin the book were quite different. I had to change them a couple of times, right. and I and I really settled on Poskerton because I had intended to go there um, and write a chapter about um, music within churches. And of course, Poskerton is famous for its, its Gregorian chant. Mm -hmm. um, so I had intended to include Poskerton in the book, but not start it there. But in the end, because a couple of things fell through. I decided to begin in Poskerton. And actually, it, it turns out it's the perfect place to start. Mm -hmm. Because um, when I went there, I had no idea um, that it was going to be the day of the first COVID vaccination yeah, being right. given, uh, given in Britain. And so that was um, a tremendous bit of serendipity, I think. Um, a tremendous bit of good fortune. And a feeling, really, that it, that it was meant to be because it really allowed me to begin with this idea of moving from a period of darkness mm -hmm. towards, hopefully, a period of light. 
and it brings in all sorts of things like faith and belief and you know mm-hmm. in, in the modern day what that means um so when you're describing steeplechasing to people how do you do it what do you say it's about rather than just churches yeah i i, I think I, I i quite often define it in some ways by what it's not mm-hmm. it's not a history book it's not an architecture book it's not a guidebook, although it, it does have elements mm-hmm. of all those things. I mean, a, a travel book with bells on is, is how we've, <laughs> we've, we've, we've come to be describing it. But really, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a celebration of, of churches. You know, it's a celebration of these places um, in terms of the relationship, which is a, 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 something that I'm, I'm fascinated by in, in all of my work, mm-hmm. the relationship between people and place yeah. and the, the way that one shapes the other. Um, a celebration of churches for their 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 beauty, of course, um, and, and and often the, the things that are contained within them. You know, um, I do think of churches as being essentially like um, a, you know a, a hoard of jewels that have been scattered across the island. Mm. You know, you can walk into a, a church in the middle of the countryside and come across some treasure mm-hmm. that would would be a star sight of the British Museum. You know, but it, it's. And it would be kept behind glass and yeah. protected, um, but in, but it's actually just in this little weird church in the middle of nowhere, and you can walk in for free and have a poke about at it if you so wish, you know. Mm-hmm. So that's a you know a, a, obviously a strength of churches, but also a, a, a vulnerability because they're open to uh, vandalism and so mm-hmm. forth. But yeah, that's that's how I describe the book. It's it's really a, a celebration of churches. But it's it's not just about their history mm-hmm. um, and and their appearance. It's very much about their life, and yeah. it's about now. It's it's a it's a book about the present as much as it is about the deep past. Yeah, because we often think I think about churches as something from the past, mm-hmm. although they're still standing. But this book looks at how they are today, mm-hmm. good and bad, or positive and negative. So why did you want to write it? I think. Um, uh, I wanted to write it for a couple of reasons, and first of all, it, it suggested itself very strongly while I was working upon my previous book, a Tomb of the View, yeah. which was about um, uh, graveyards um, and cemeteries and burial grounds more generally. Um, in, in the course of working on that book, I went to um, King's Lynn mm-hmm. um, to interview um, Dr. Julian Lytton, who was, who's an expert on, on funeral customs. And while I was in Kings Lynn, someone I know said to me, oh, if you're in Kings Lynn, you should definitely take a little trip into the countryside to the, the village of Stobardov, right. um, where um, you'll see something you really need to see, which is the the, the wax effigy of uh, Sarah Hare, mm-hmm. um, a, a, a sort of mem- member of the local nobility who died in the 18th century and who had herself in her will. She, she In her will, she asked that she should be... Um, her, her body should be, her likeness should be made in wax and set up um, above her grave. And it's this incredible sort of fairy tale looking, Miss Havisham looking, don't look now looking right. thing that, that really is, 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 is wonderful and, and horrible and eerie and strange. And so I, when I saw that, I thought, oh, that's amazing. I should definitely put that in the tomb with a view. Mm-hmm. But somehow I didn't. Um, right. And I think I decided just to hang on to it for future use in some way or other. And and, and, and from that acorn, really, um, the idea of doing um, a, a book on churches and, and the, the some of the strange things they contain or interesting things they contain grew. So there was there was that there was there was the idea of you know one one idea setting off the next, but also uh, I I was really after something that would offer me some kind of sense of consolation. I think, um, I, like many people, I'm sure I'd come to feel very bleak and almost despairing mm. about the state of the world. Um, politics, British, British, and British politics and politics more generally. Um, the, the feeling of being lied to constantly. Um, and, and, and also against that, the, the sort of bigger, deeper more complicated climate emergency. Mm-hmm. All of these kind of feelings, um, I think, crowding in upon me, and also the the pandemic on, mm-hmm. on top of that. So really, I was looking for something that would um, be, a, 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 if not an antidote, at least some sort of um, way of, of helping with uh, despair, really. Mm-hmm. And so um, I thought I might find that by spending a lot of time 
within old churches. Not really necessarily as a as a religious impulse. Yeah. Not as a sort of search for God, um, but as a search for some kind of meaning and solace and escapism. And you mentioned a tomb with a view there, so this can really be seen as a companion piece to it, yeah. I would say so. I think they're I think they're bookends. I think they're 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 related. Yes. And I'm guessing when you did we were researching a tomb with a view, well, a lot of churches would have been. Just there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I guess they were in my field of vision and, yeah. <laughs> and in my mind, but I, I really hadn't thought until really quite late on that I could potentially do a church book. Mm. And what's, this is probably one of the big questions, but what's your relationship with churches and religion more generally? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm very careful in the book not to say um, whether I have a religious faith or not, mm-hmm. um, what my particular beliefs or disbeliefs are. A lot, some of the reviews that have been coming out so far have tended to, to read it as being a book written by someone that doesn't have mm-hmm. religious faith. It's interesting that that's how, how it's being interpreted. Um, and I, I don't say, and I, I, and I won't say, because I feel that it's um, that would be a distraction from the book. Mm-hmm. I, I want it to be um, a book that can be read and enjoyed and mean something to anyone, whether mm-hmm. they have a... A, a Christian faith or, or, or some other faith or, or, or no faith at all so I don't want my own personal beliefs or disbeliefs to, to get in the way of that or to colour it in any way mm-hmm. um, but to talk about my own background I mean I, I, I was born in Stirling mm-hmm. and um, spent the f- first part of my life there and um, was baptised in the Viewfield Parish Church right. on, on Irvine Place in Stirling, which is the, the steep hill yeah. on which we, we stayed. Um, and I, I, was, I went to Sunday school after that, mm-hmm. and for some reason wearing a kilt. I'm not quite sure <laughs> why that happened. It wasn't really a personal choice, but um, for some reason I, I did wear a kilt to Sunday school. And I was definitely uh, interested in um, the, the, the Bible stories that you would learn yeah. at that time. And, I, and throughout my childhood... I was attracted to um, the, the melodies of, of hymns and so forth and the names of the books of the Bible, you know, the kind of rhythm of that, you know, Genesis, mm-hmm. Exodus, mm-hmm. Leviticus, that kind of commuter train rhythm. Um, but we weren't a family in which religion was important. You know, we weren't, yeah. we weren't really a church-going family. It was that classic sort of Church of Scotland is your default position, but it doesn't really mean anything to you. Um, I guess fewer and fewer people are baptised now, but back then it was a bit, bit more common. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. It would happen, um, and and yeah. So it hasn't been a it hasn't been a huge feature of my life. But I think as I've got older, I've certainly been drawn more to, to churches as spaces. Mm-hmm. Um, I can say that much. Yeah, it's really interesting because when you say people had kind of assumptions about it, then I started thinking, was I making assumptions about reading it? But actually. Our uh, experience is so close, even down to kilts. Really? Me and my brother were dressed in kilts by my mum and dad when we started going as kids. To Sunday school? To Sunday school, to church, and then Sunday school was after it. It's not funny? I know. So it must have been in there. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, myself went as a kid, a uh, Church of Scotland, yeah. and a... Um, even when I was in the Boys' Brigade, won prizes for my Bible knowledge and all that kind of mm. stuff. But pretty quickly went, this isn't for me. Mm-hmm. And I think it, it's interesting that uh, I, I drove past the old church in Canvas Land quite recently and it had lots of uh, Ukrainian flags outside and it's clearly being used yeah. for something other than the church it once was. And when we're sitting in Strath Bungo, there's so many incredible churches in this area mm-hmm. that again, a lot of them, you know, some of them still are churches, but they're used for so many different things. I'm kind of getting away from that, but it's interesting to hear that there are certain assumptions. And I probably did make assumptions, but it was because when you were talking about, you know, again, being baptised, which I can't remember, I don't know how many people are these days, and it being kind of such a big deal. And it's really imprinted strongly, the memories of that, you know, the people, we all sat in the same place mm-hmm. every week, you mm-hmm. know, that was like, well, that's where our family sat, and you could see that's where we such and such. And so... I guess what I'm getting to is the changes you're going in there and a lot of these places will not be as we've experienced them. Mm-hmm. 
in terms of they're not being they're not being they're not being used by as many people or as yes, yeah, 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 absolutely. I mean, another aspect of my my work, I think, um, that has manifested itself over the books I've written is an interest in the uh, in things that are fading away. Mm. You know, I've I've definitely got a sort of instinct for uh, the elegiac. Um, very, very drawn to that, and I think um, I'm probably drawn to um, Christianity and, and, and kind of church buildings mm-hmm. for that for that reason. The idea that we're witnessing something which has been humbled and which is a little bit frail and, and, and it's old and it's passing away, you know. So I think there's a sense of of wanting to try to 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 capture that um, at, at this precise moment as well. Well, you still can. I mean, we're We've got a situation where um, you know fewer and fewer people are going to church every year. That has been massively accelerated by the experience of the pandemic. Mm. Um, church buildings won't stay open if there's nobody going to the services. You know they'll they'll, they'll be closed. They'll be sold off. Um, so so there is a sense of um, these these buildings being um, in, in a state of crisis. Mm-hmm. I think one one person in the book says to me, "We're facing the apocalypse" or something like that. Yeah. So yeah, I, I did feel like I was I was witnessing um, the end of something or getting towards the end of something, um, but within all these places, there's people who are absolutely committed to the mm-hmm. idea. They're committed to keeping the churches open, um, either as as religious spaces or as historic spaces. You know, they're committed to turning up on a Sunday. They're committed to sweeping the the back droppings off the pews. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was I was very moved by people's dedication to this this thing, which for, which for most people is is, is passing away. Yeah, um, and that's the idea that the people themselves are are passing away or at least diminishing. Mm. But these buildings, some of them of real substance of substance, will not be passing away. They may become flats or weather spoons or whatever they mm-hmm. may be. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think you know, going back to our own childhoods, you know, in most people's childhoods. Um, a church building is probably the, the 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 first building that most people go into that's got anything architecturally uh, significant about it. You know, so it's a first experience of like um, a special building in, in some sense, and that that specialness is is intensified by the by the purpose for which it's mm-hmm. for which it's intended. Um, but certainly, um, in terms of the, the the age of the buildings, that's something I, I find very thrilling. Mm-hmm. The idea that um, these spaces um, have been used for many many centuries you know going back to uh, the Norman conquest or even before in, in, in some cases and that the sites in which they stand will have been used probably for sacred reasons mm-hmm. and possibly even pre-christian reasons for a long time before that so these this this kind of spot on the landscape has been important to people for you know over a thousand years um, hugely drawn to that and I, I think also, Within that is the idea of kind of human continuity, so the idea that uh, people have been coming here, not really that different from from, from you or I, feeling a lot of the same things. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they they they've come to these buildings um, to praise God, but they've also come to declare their love mm-hmm. um, for for another human being. Uh, they've come to baptize their child in the hope that it will have a, a long and, and, and good life. You know they've come in moments of of, of, of sorrow and grief and despair, um, and they've come looking for 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 hope. And I think all of that does get into the stones. I think mm. I, f- I feel that very very strongly um, that somehow the stones have absorbed those things o- over the years. They've they've acted as sort of receivers or sponges uh, for for that kind of accumulated ache of of, of human experience. And you, and that that I think is what you, what I feel often when I walk into one of these spaces. I think it helps when you go in there alone. I think if you mm. go in with someone else and you're talking, you don't feel it so strongly. But if you go in with um, by yourself, I think you you can really sense that, and you can see on the walls very often um, boards that list like the priests that have mm. sort of served over the centuries, so you can identify the years of of of, of the Black Death, the years of the English Civil War. Um, or you know in Scotland other things like that um, and you, you sort of have a feeling that you know people have gone through some of the same stuff that we've gone through you know yeah. they've gone through um, pandemics you know they've gone through a time of war as we are experiencing just now albeit in, in Ukraine rather mm-hmm. than in our own country um, 
and and uh, they've experienced uh, loneliness and they've experienced hunger and they've experienced uh, community and happiness and and we feel those things too and so we're sort of connected to them by our shared experience of the building and you think now because there's, there's there's a need for all of those things but people are finding them in different buildings and in different communities rather than church well certainly fewer and fewer people are going to church yeah. unquestionably but i'm saying you don't have to be a church goer to go to church yeah, you know yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm saying that you know what makes these places special is not necessarily that they're the house of god but that people have consider yeah. them to be the house of God for so long and so when you go through that door even if you're not going there on a Sunday to pray if you're just going as a visitor mm -hmm. you can be in touch with some of that stuff and uh, are, do you think people are visiting just going as visitors to see these buildings more than previously that is hard to say um, again it was something that was massively affected by the pandemic mm -hmm. when people couldn't really couldn't really do that you you go into a church though and you do see names in the visitors book you know yeah. i was i was recently uh, last week i was i was down in whitby mm -hmm. and uh, we took a walk along the along the beach to uh, sands end uh, and then up into the hills to um the village of Lythe, and there's a there's a very very old there's a church there it's not that the building itself is only victorian but it's sort of it's built upon a church that was there in earlier times, and they've got Viking, um, you know, gravestones and stuff in yeah. the church. Um, and you know, it's a wee church, really in the middle of nowhere. Hardly anybody lives there. It's not, not that easy to get to if you're walking. But there were names in the visitors' book. You know, yeah. people do go and seek it out, and seek it out, and they get something out of it. They may not go in huge numbers, yeah. but they, but they do go. It's interesting you say a couple of times about the pandemic affecting. Uh, church attendance because part of me would think it might have been the opposite that people were um, needing faith again mm -hmm. in, in the way that um, a, maybe hadn't been the case before the pandemic that mm -hmm. they need to think we are going to get out of this yeah. this a uh, vaccine will work uh, you know yeah. I, I guess people were you get out the habit of even being in large numbers mm -hmm. I mean well churches were um went online during the pandemic mm. you know so people were people were worshiping online so typically um a, a priest would would or minister would go into the church and uh in front of a camera uh, give the service mm. and his uh, or her parishioners would, would be watching at home you know but they they weren't able to use the building that's what i'm saying yeah. and you know some of the older people will have died during mm. that experience and, and some will have become too frail to go and some will have just got out of the habit of going so i think i think faith was certainly important to people during the pandemic mm -hmm. um, but I think church going is a slightly different thing right okay and you, churches that you visit um, I, they're fairly different in, you know in, throughout the book this is the Daily Mirror question do you have <laughs> favourites? Um, I think do I have favourites? It's it's hard to say favourites, but but I, I got sort of different things from 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 different churches mm -hmm. really, uh, you know. In, in Scotland, um, to talk about the sort of Scottish experiences, you know, it was wonderful to go to a uh, Abbey and sit in silence for a few days, really, um, listening to the monks singing their Gregorian chant and uh, occasionally interviewing one of them. Uh -huh. um, that was that was a, a, a quite an intense and and, and 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 beautiful experience. Also in Edinburgh, I went to Morningside Parish Church, which mm -hmm. is just a, a you know, quite a normal church in some ways. But they they had given it over to um, the administering of the the COVID vaccine. So I saw um, people uh, aged eighty and above being given their their injections. So those were the first people, the first wave of people to to, mm -hmm. to get given the the vaccine. And they were all spaced two meters apart, and there was someone playing, you know, playing the organ, and it was just an incredible thing to see uh, the injection being given. It did feel religious, or yeah. spiritual. It felt like a, a Eucharistic moment where something was was brought into the body to kind of strengthen and save. But I also go to um, went to uh, St Peter's Seminary, the the sort of brutalist ruin. Mm. Um, um, in Car uh, Cardross, um, yeah, yeah. which is which I'd never been to before. Well, I've never done it. Really makes me want to go and visit. Yeah. I've seen photographs of it before, but it's, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, it's it's fenced off. You know, you're not you're not really meant to okay. go. In, you're not really meant to go into the site. I should say for listeners. <laughs> um, but it, it, it wasn't. It, that was an incredible experience. And St. Bride's um, 
church in East Kilbride, mm-hmm. which is also by the same architects, Gillespie, Gillespie Kidd and Coya, another one of those sort of 1960s brutalist churches that looks more like a factory than... Yeah. The, the, I mean, St. Some, some Peter Samuel looks like a spaceship, uh, and now it's, this, now it's the ruin of a spaceship, yeah. and it looks like something from, from Prometheus or something. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> But St Bride's is still is still up and running, and it's really worth a visit. I, I, so I, I like I like them all, you know. I like everything from the little country churches in the middle of you know the English shires to the great cathedrals. Mm-hmm. Um, it was an incredible thing to visit um, Durham Cathedral. Yeah. You know, um, I went there um, to visit the the shrine of St Cuthbert. Mm-hmm. Um, who he's the, the fact that he's buried there is the reason that Durham Cathedral exists, you know. Um, and before the Reformation, it would have been a, a shrine of tremendous splendor, covered in gold and jewels. But now it's a for a long time since Henry VIII, it's been a, yeah. a marble slab on the floor. Um, but I, I went there having earlier in the day been, been at the Angel of the North, um, and what I didn't know when I visited the Angel of the North was that it itself has become a kind of shrine. Right. So people have, um, at, at the foot of the slope below the um, angel, there's a there's a, a sort of line of trees screening it mm-hmm. partly from the from the motorway, and people have strung sort of tinsel and and they've left baubles and little messages and things in those trees, remembering uh, people they've loved that they've, yeah. they've lost, you know, um, and the impulse is the same. I think you know, mm-hmm. obviously. St Cuthbert is an important saint of the church and he's a hugely important religious and cultural figure. But the impulse is the same. People, even if they don't have a form of religious faith, are still looking for something um, bigger than and beyond human to um, watch over them, watch over those that, that have gone. So I was moved by the, 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 the sort of the closeness of those two things, even though they're separated by centuries mm-hmm. and by, by very different scales. And of course, as you say, the book is also about people rather than just buildings. So yeah, a, a favourite probably isn't a thing that you could have because every experience is mm. different down to how people interact with the building. Yes, yes. And I mean, I've, I've met some incredible people, you know. I mean, it's really important to me to try to get other voices into these books. You know, mm. it, 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 I really do not want... what I don't like books, in particular travel books, that are just like some guy wandering around being wry about things, you know. <laughs> Um, really important to get other voices in there and um, so it was a privilege to meet so many um, fascinating people like Pascal McAllison who's um, the stonemason, French stonemason who looks after Gloucester Cathedral he's got a tremendous sense of the fact that the work he's doing now will be will survive for, for centuries and mm-hmm. he's helping to keep the keep that, that that living building alive you know um, yeah it was it was it was really hugely important to get to get other voices and other people in there and do you have a uh, approach to interviewing, or did it just come from your kind of natural curiosity about what others do and, and are? I mean, I, logistically, I will um, record them. So I, I yeah. record, I, re- I record uh, the the sort of formal longer interviews mm-hmm. with a little voice recorder, which I will later transcribe. Um, and I'll generally have a, a list of questions I want to ask people, but only after having really thought pretty hard about um, who they are and what. Um, sorts of things they might want to talk about, you know, and what I want to know. So I'm I'm, I'm going there sort of formally prepared, if you like. Um, but then it is a, a, a question of um, just trying to respond to them as people, mm-hmm. and I and I think um, a, a lot of it is to do with um, people just picking up on the fact you aren't out to exploit them in any way. I think if you if you kind of go there um, with a good heart, if that isn't too sentimental a way of, of putting it, I think people actually can feel that and they respond to mm-hmm. it by um, speaking to you um, yeah, honestly honestly, and um, uh, quite deeply sometimes. And do you spend time with people before you ask the questions? It feels like you do. It feels like you've got to know them. Well, there will have been, um, a, 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 there will have been a period of setting it up. Yeah, of course, so we'll yeah. have been in touch. Um, uh, on the phone and by email and so on. So by the time I actually come to meet them, yeah. we've already had some. We've already got some sort of relationship. But then I, I ask the questions quite quickly after that. You know, I, we don't spend a lot of time hanging out before I ask the questions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, people know that I'm there to do a particular thing, and and they're happy happy to do that. And do you ever worry that someone's going to take offence or uh, the way they've been represented? Because it's it's a very personal thing. Um, 
religion in general, but you know, church going or, or, or things like that. Do you ever worry that? It's, it's not really that I would worry that they would take offence. It's more that I worry that they would feel that they'd been in some way misrepresented yeah, yeah. or if they'd, they'd maybe said something that they later regretted sort of thing. So I, I do feel a, a, a duty of care towards the people that I interview. Um, a responsibility to try yeah. to put across uh, truthfully and accurately um, not only what they say but kind of what they're about and who they are as people and what it feels like to be in their company. Mm-hmm. Um, and... Uh, I, I will for for the books send them the bits that the, in which they appear for them to look over. Right. And sometimes, well, actually, that's it's a very useful thing to do. It's not something that I do in my journalism because mm-hmm. it's really up to the to the newspapers to to sort of make that sort of call, and they often don't like doing that kind of thing. Yeah. But in the books, I will send the 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 the, the, uh, the passages to people to have a look over. I'm not giving them the right of veto. Mm-hmm. But I'm saying to them that I, I want tell me if you feel there's something wrong here, mm-hmm. that, something that I've got wrong, or something that you you, you you dislike, and we can talk about it. And sometimes you do pick up on little inaccuracies, so that's really helpful. Mm-hmm. And, but quite often you'll, you'll they'll tell you something new, which is also really helpful. Um, so yes, yeah, that's the, that's the process. And I guess and that must be so comforting for them because when you open up in the way that some people do in the book, you would be, I, I would be concerned about how that would read on the page rather than just us having a conversation. I mean, they are, they're trusting me. Or they're, yeah, they're trusting me with what they say to me. And so I want to kind of repay that trust by giving them the chance to have a look at it mm-hmm. and, and to feel that they're being looked after. And can we talk a little bit more about the structure of the book? I'm interested if your travels shape how the book is structured or does the book, do you already have an idea about, you know, how it's going to be? I had, I had certain ideas in advance. Um, it was, I, I, I had an idea quite early on that I wanted to begin the book with a candle being lit and I had an idea that I might finish the book with a candle being snuffed. Right. Um, now, that isn't how the book ends. Um, yeah. I, I won't tell people how the book does end, but that, that idea didn't, didn't quite work out. But I do begin with a candle being lit, um, but it's a different candle from what I'd originally planned. Right. So, <laughs> so I, I, there, was a, there was a few different ideas about what that might entail. Um, and of course, we settled on, on Plusgrid and Abbey. So I had, a, a sense of, I had a sense of the idea of the book beginning and ending with, with kind of light in some way. Mm-hmm. And really what that developed into was that the book would would begin with a chapter called Darkness, but with a candle being lit right. at the start of it, and end with a candle, and, and end with, with light. The chapter at the end is called mm-hmm. Light. Um, and so the idea with the book is that it would move from, from darkness to light, literally and metaphorically. Um, but I wrote it during and throughout uh, the coronavirus pandemic, mm-hmm. so I didn't know what was going to happen yeah. with that. So my hope had been that um, it would be able to, I would be able to end on a, on a, on a tremendously optimistic note. Um, now, I felt when I actually, I, without giving the end of the end of the book away, I felt that by the time I kind of got to the to the end to writing the end of the book, that it would have been that would have been a false note. Mm-hmm. That would have been the wrong thing to do. So I I, I sort of slightly temper that a little bit. Um, but beyond, so I had, so I had an idea of how to, how to begin it and how to end it. Um, but beyond that, um, structurally, I also had a sense that I wanted to try to cover a fair bit of, of the country, not all of it. I mean, it can't. It, it just it's four hundred pages long, you yeah. know, as, as as it can't be comprehensive. Um, I had an idea that I wanted to kind of cover quite a lot of the country mm-hmm. country within it um, and different aspects of of, of churches. So. To, to do with like stone or you know the idea that they might be at risk is, is sort of covered in a, a mm-hmm. chapter called dust um, and then with, within the chapters themselves they're generally they generally fall into three different sections so um, I might cover three different churches or three different places within the same broad theme um, so that's 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 really how I've done it the, mm-hmm. the structure is quite complicated I think yeah um, and it, it but it's kind of linked by references to particular writers and things like T.S. Eliot keeps coming up yeah. and, 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 and John Donne pops up a few times and Virginia Woolf um, so there's there's certain things that, that link it and I hope it feels like a thematic whole um, 
but yeah, the structure was was, was complex. It, it, it really does read as a as a whole, but you, and you never are pulled short by you know thinking oh this has been done before or this mm-hmm. thing. As you say, the chapters are themed mm-hmm. at least you know with, with, with by the names of them. The chapter when is an interesting one. Yeah. Because it feels to me that it's as much about London and the Thames in particular. Um, yeah. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I mean, the chapter, the, London is covered a few times mm-hmm. within the book. Um, I, I write a chapter, the third chapter in the book is called Fire, and it's about yeah. St Paul's Cathedral. Um, and it looks particularly at um, the Great Fire of London, the threat of destruction by fire during the Second World War and mm-hmm. also its, its sort of present meaning as a sort of pr- protective force mm-hmm. on, on, on the sort of uh, London and Eng- on the London skyline and within the English consciousness I think. Yeah. Um, and then there's a chapter called Cats which is a, to do with like um, the cat Dorkin's Magnificat that lived mm-hmm. within Southwark Cathedral in London. But then there's a, but then there is a, a chapter towards the end called, called When which is about um, which is the one you ask about and mm-hmm. it's about it's about London, many London churches and religious moments. Um, and uh, it's an interesting chapter because it's, it's the only one in the book that's written in the present tense. Mm. The, the whole of the, 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 book is, the book is generally written in the past tense um, because I've come to feel most comfortable writing in that tense. It's my sort of default way of writing. But I wanted to write when in the present tense because... I have a feeling about London in particular that 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 past and present are going on all at once. Yeah. Everything in history, everything in history, um, is happening all at the same time in London. It feels to me as as a city that that constantly renews itself. So you know the Romans are still sailing up the Thames mm-hmm. e- even now as as the, as the Sex Pistols are going down in there in the other direction. You know, and the and the present sort of tourist barges are are, are going up and. Uh, and Thomas More and Rudolf Hess both occupy cells adjoining each other in the Tower of London. This is this is the way I, I, I sort of feel about London, that it's a, it, it's a perpetual presence. I, I wrote that in the present tense. And I, I just find the city completely fascinating. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I've, it's only really in recent years that I've come to see it through the prism of the churches, you know. So as I kind of walk around within London, I now can tell one church from the other right. and, and sort of see it. I'm looking sort of spirewards rather than rather than skywards or, or, or down you know, down at the map. You know, that's that's how I kind of see London now through through the the prism of the churches. And that idea of the city having the memory and the memory always present is mm. a really interesting one. And as an aside, I totally forgotten about the pearly kings and queens as a thing. <laughs> as a thing, I didn't know that was still a thing, but yeah. of course it will be. Yeah, I think they just had a big moment during the coronation there. Mm. I think they were they were they had they had to do with that. Um, but yeah, it was it was wonderful to meet them. They have a, they have a, a the pearly kings and queens. Um, there's a, a few different pearly kings and queens organisations right. that are sort of rival organisations, right. and they have um, harvest festivals in both St Martin in the Fields mm-hmm. and St Mary Le Beau. And it was the St Mary Le Beau harvest festival that I, I attended, and also went up to the to the bell tower to to write a bit about the about the famous bow bells. Which uh, you know, Dick Whittington knew all about. That's the structure of that chapter in particular. I thought this feels like it could have been longer, or, or, or you know, a book in itself. That mm-hmm. kind of feeling. Um, I wanted it to feel like a drift. Yeah, a, yes, a, a, that's absolutely a, a drift through London, um, through the seasons and through the centuries. Mm-hmm. Really, you know, thought about doing that with other cities that you admire. It would be. A th- I think it'd be really an interesting read. You know. Yeah, I guess so. But I just, I just feel it so strongly in London. Right, you know, okay. I've, I've just always felt that. You know, whenever I've, ever since I start, started going to the city. And you mentioned in the book how churches engage the senses. Mm-hmm. Could you expand a bit on that? Well, I think it's not just the sight. You know, I think the the sight is the is the first thing. Um, but I think when you open the door of a church. Um, it's the smell that hits you, you know, that, that, that smell of damp and dust with a kind of like slight air of um, mouse dropping and bat dropping in there somewhere. Um, <laughs> I haven't been at a top for a long time. <laughs> that's the, that's, that's, the, that's the, let me tell you, that's the, that's the bouquet that you get. Um, and, and also I think, especially um, if you go into an old church on a hot day, like I, when I was, mm-hmm. when I was in Norfolk, you know, it was, I was in Norfolk during um, a heat wave, you know, it was, absolutely meltingly hot, uncomfortably hot 
you know, dangerously hot, really. Right. And and to walk into these old churches, these thick stone walls, and to feel the sort of slightly damp air was such a, a kind of relief and a blessing, you know. So I think it's I think it's all of that, you know, for for people who are who are church crawlers as they call themselves, yeah. these these enthusiasts, their experience of churches is not just um, academic. You know, they're not just interested in comparing. Um, you know, one bench end with another. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's sensory. You know, this is a this is a pleasure. It's a delight, yeah. and part of it is the smell, uh, the feel of the building, the 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 the, the, uh, the noises of the bells or the or the rain on the roof. You know, all, all those things. It's a it's a sensory pleasure. I think a church. Yeah, we get a touch of the stone, and I mean, that's something I really remember from you know. Yeah. That, that, you... Or putting your hand on a on a bench end that um you know thousands of hands yeah. have touched over the centuries. You know, you're you're you're. You're touching the past literally, and church art can range from the simple to the kind of extravagant. But I'd like you to talk a bit more about Alice and Watts Still, which is in Old St Paul's. Is that right? In yeah. Edinburgh? Because this is a piece that's been brought in from outside, but it's now it remains powerful, or it makes the the church even more. Yeah. So Alice and Watt, um, the the great Scottish painter, um, painted her her work still. Specifically for that space, right. for for Old St Paul's in Edinburgh, um, the idea was that it would be um, displayed there during um, one Edinburgh festival. But the people liked it so much that yeah. they decided to keep it. Uh, it's in um, a side chapel of the church. Mm-hmm. Old St Paul's people that don't know is um, the church um, sort of below North Bridge. Yeah, uh, which I had no idea was there, and I was in Edinburgh recently and went specifically to look at it. Oh, what yeah. did you think? Oh, I didn't go inside just to uh, find out where the church is. I will do that in the future. Mm. But I love Alison Watts' yeah. work anyway. Yeah, so it's a tremendously... I think it's a melancholy church. Right. That's my own feeling about it. And I, I hope I don't offend the people that, that attend there by saying that. I feel a sadness in that space. Um, and in one of the side chapels, which is a chapel dedicated to um, those who have fallen in the war, um, this, this painting um, hangs on one of the walls. And it, um, it, it depicts um, white cloth. It's just white cloth. Mm-hmm. But it, it, and it's not explained what that actually is, but it obviously brings to mind um, like Christ's robes or, or winding sheets more mm-hmm. generally. Um, so it seems to have something to do with, 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 with death and with, with, with loss and so on. And it's inspired by... She was, she was inspired to make the work by painter Francisco de Zerberan and his... Um, painting of, of St Francis in meditation I think that's right mm-hmm. um, uh, and I, yeah I went, I went there and I spoke with, with Alison about working on the painting um, and I spoke with Richard Holloway who, yeah. who used to be the, um, the priest there um, and yeah it definitely adds an enormous amount to that space I think you know, it, it gives a sort of certain sort of aesthetic and spiritual intensity to, to, to the space and you know many people have said that the, the church didn't feel complete until it had that, that painting with, within it you know it's very very meaningful uh, for Alison to have the painting in there um, and Richard Holloway finds it intensely moving and I really for anyone that, that, that hasn't been to see it I really do urge people to try to take the time to just just pop in there you know if they're if they're heading back to to God's own country, Glasgow. After after a day in Edinburgh, then you know, make the time to pop in there before catching the train. It's, it's just it struck me talking about it now that I did go to see the church and I, I was going on to another event, but I thought, oh, I've not got time to go and do that now. But I wonder if there's part of me, because I haven't been in a church for a long time, that that crossing the door and going into that kind of space, there's some discomfort perhaps what, for me. Well, what is that? I don't know. I guess it's probably lack of. Faith and you know losing my religion for want of a better term, you know. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But this isn't. But, but being young and it being such a big thing and you know and yeah. sacred and with such meaning that I think well I don't belong in there anymore. Yeah. It, you know I don't know just something that uh, I've thought about now. I mean I think that's probably quite a common experience that people feel that there's some that, that there's some slightly sort of taboo about stepping over the threshold yeah. and into a church or they're not welcome by. I, I would. I would try to encourage people to to try and get past that feeling yeah. and go in there and just 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 try it. I mean, that that painting. Yeah, nothing bad's gonna happen. No, no, no. You're, I'm sure you're not going. From the vault. I'm sure you're not going to be struck down. <laughs> uh, I'm sure the painting won't fall from the wall onto yeah. you. But you should definitely try to go in there and see it. Yeah, I think I definitely will because it's a great chapter. And as I say, I love uh, Alison's uh, what's work anyway. So what? 
What conclusions, if any, did you reach um, when you finished the book? I don't know about any kind of ringing, thunderous, drumroll conclusions, mm. really. Um, I, I, I felt, having made the journey around Britain by church, um, I did feel uh, consoled by it. I felt um, that that came from not, it, not the promise of a better world to come, mm-hmm. but really the experience of being around a lot of uh, good-hearted and, and strong-hearted people who care about these spaces. You know, whether they have a religious faith or not, you know, they, they, sit, they see the importance in these, in these buildings. And they, they want to make sure that they, they stay open for, for either for public worship or for you know for visitors or or for both um, so I, I found it, it it was personally pretty helpful to me to, to, to make this journey you know it's not I, I wasn't trying to find optimism mm-hmm. I, I read I, I wasn't trying to find a feeling of optimism I was trying to find a feeling of hope really um, I read Nick Cave's book uh, Faith Hope and Carnage recently. Right. And I think he says that, that, that hope is optimism with a broken heart. And I think that's, that's quite a good way of looking at it. I think that's probably got um, some resonance uh, with, with this book too, you know. So um, I think I, I found it a feeling of solace in the, in, in the churches that I visited and the people that I met along the way. And I hope that people that read the book will feel something of that too. That's a really interesting phrase because... There is hope throughout the book, but there is melancholy as well, mm-hmm. you know, and I think that's probably uh, unavoidable when you're writing about such spaces. Mm-hmm. Is that how you felt? Yeah, I think, I think, I think, I think because it's in them, but it's also in me. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think, I think the mood of the book does lighten as it goes on. As I said, mm-hmm. I had this idea that it would, it would move from 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 darkness to light, and I think it does. Yeah. You you can tell me, but I think it, yeah. I, I think it lifts and lightens, and there's more jokes as <laughs> as, as, as it goes along. You know, it's never going to reach a point of euphoria and and, and giddiness, but um, I, I think that it, it does move towards a feeling of of yeah, of of, of 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 resilience and despair avoided. And is that a result of you becoming more contemplative? through writing this book as, as it was moving forward? Well, I wrote it as I went along. Yeah. So I didn't do the journey right. and sit down and write it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it was more it was more the experience of being the in the places. Yeah, yeah. Rather, rather than the writing, yeah. Uh, and what, this, I guess you've maybe answered this, but do you have a thought about what the future is for these buildings, having visited them? You know, there are people, as you say, that are still very passionate about mm-hmm. keeping them open, but you know, 10, 20, 50 years down the line, that might be different. Oh, yeah. I mean, 50, you'll be lucky, I think. I mean, the, these places are in, in in crisis. You know, there is a problem with funding. I mean, mm. these buildings are... are, are the, the upkeep of these buildings is paid for by the people that worship in them. You know, they're, yeah. they're not funded by governments and they're not funded by the church as an institution. You know, they're funded by their parishioners. Mm. Um, and so with fewer and fewer parishioners, older and older parishioners... You you are, you are facing a situation where a lot of them are going to close down unless some way is found of keeping them open. You mm-hmm. know, so so the the future is not particularly bright for for Britain's churches, I don't think. But they are massively important as repositories of cultural memory mm-hmm. and as uh, wonderful spaces to go into now. And so I think we do need to find a way to preserve at least those which are. Um, significant mm-hmm. in some way, and which, is, said, which is a, which is a lot of them. Yeah, they? yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you said at the beginning that one of the reasons for writing this book was because the future seemed so bleak. Mm-hmm. Has it helped you have more hope for the future and, and, and uh, you know moving forward? I think it. Uh, I think it. Uh, I don't feel massively optimistic, mm. but I feel broken-heartedly hopeful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, before we wrap up, is there anything else you're working on that you can tell us about, or is it all about sequel chasing at the moment? I've got um, a couple of other ideas. I've got an idea for another non-fiction book. Um, I've got an idea for a novel, um, but neither of those things are particularly uh, well developed. Right. I need some space and time to think about it, um, give it some serious thought, and, and, and work at what I want to do next. I mean, I, I do feel like if I never did write another book, then I'm content with this book. This book is 
in my opinion, my best book. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if I can write a better book than this. Um, so if people said that was it, that's your lot, I would accept it. But hopefully not. Hopefully, hopefully I will write something not. else. I absolutely, hopefully not. And before we, we go, we first met when you were a journalist at The List mm. back in the day, and The List is back with us. You must be happy about that. Yeah, and in fact, um, they've got a feature with me in, in, in there right now. Um, but no, it's wonderful to see, to see The List back, you know... Um, Obviously, it's had its, its kind of its crosses to bear mm-hmm. um, in terms of um, coping with the world of the internet and mm-hmm. being able to get their listings online. But yeah, I'm, I'm, I learned a lot from working there. You know, it was my first professional job in journalism. Yeah. I met some friends that um, I'm still friends with now, and you know, more power to them. I say absolutely, and it does seem in general that print has had a bit of a resurrection, if I can use that phrase. <laughs> well, uh, yeah. You know, when it was thought that digital versions would. You know, magazines like the list and others seem to be coming through. Bookshops, apparently, independent bookshops in particular, are doing well. Um, would you agree with that? Is this I, w- I would, yeah. I mean, in, in terms of the in terms of the books, there isn't. You, you, I think people do feel it's the same with the vinyl records, isn't it? Yeah. People feel um, a great delight in having the actual artifacts. I mean, this be, this book of mine um, I, I, is, is, I think, very beautiful. Um, and it wouldn't be quite as beautiful on in its yeah. digital form. Yeah. People, people should feel free to buy the digital form, <laughs> of course. And, and independent bookshops, um, I'm going to uh, do an event at Golden Hair Books mm-hmm. in, in Edinburgh uh, tomorrow. And I think what you what you feel when you go into these independent spaces is a sense of um, you're you're entering the, the the consciousness and taste of another human being. Mm-hmm. So the feeling of them being kind of curated, really, yeah, uh, and, and thought about is is a really um, really pleasant thing when you go in. Absolutely. Well, Peter, thanks so much for talking to me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And we'll be back soon with someone completely different. Cheers. <laughs>